Welcome, stranger. On the 9th of September 2015, Queen Elizabeth II surpassed Victoria as the longest reigning British monarch. In 2017, she celebrated her Sapphire Jubilee, having worn the crown for 65 years. Her reign came as a result of hundreds of years of political action through multiple usurpations, civil wars, and revolutions. What if some of these decisions and events had not happened? Would dear old Liz still be chillaxing at Buckingham Palace? Or would a very different person be sitting on the throne? It's exciting to explore alternative histories, and royal succession is no exception. I'm Johnny from Mortar and Ivy, and these are 10 alternative successions to the British throne. Number 10. The Cromwells Elected a member of parliament in 1628, Oliver Cromwell perhaps would never have guessed to what heights his political career would grow. After joining the English Civil Wars on behalf of the Republican Roundheads, Cromwell would go on to lead his new model army to victory against the Royalist farces in 1649, subsequently signing the execution orders for King Charles I. Though Royalist forces would continue fighting in honor of Charles' son, the future Charles II, the newly formed Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland was essentially without a king. Opting not to adopt the title after being offered the crown multiple times, Cromwell chose to be Lord Protector instead. He reigned over the British Isles for five years before dying of multiple infections. After his death, his son Richard was declared Lord Protector in his stead. Not too keen on the role, Richard Cromwell was easily overthrown, and King Charles II was invited out of exile and the British line of succession was re-established, to which it remains this day. But what if the monarchy was not re-established? What if the Cromwell clan continued reigning for generations after? Who would currently hold the short-lived title? It's not actually known for certain. Richard Cromwell had many children, and records from there share some dispute. One option is Catherine, the Duchess of Kent. Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Kent, is currently married to the Duke of Kent, Prince Edward, first cousin to Queen Elizabeth II. Had things have been different, she might have been Lady Protector instead. However, as all her children and grandchildren are ineligible to reign as either being Catholic or married to a Catholic, the Protectorate would likely pass to another branch of the family. Though in this reality, the 1701 Act of Settlement might not have been signed, leaving Catholics able to rule, or should I say, protect, the Commonwealth. Number 9. Absolute Primogeniture from Queen Victoria In 2015, the governments of all 16 Commonwealth realms enacted absolute primogeniture, that is, succession of the eldest child regardless of gender. Before then, male heirs were preferred to female, therefore the Queen's youngest son Edward would succeed before his older sister Anne the Princess Royal. Now this act only applies to the children of William and Kate and onward. It does not affect the current line as it is not retroactive. Though, were it to have been applied retroactively back to, say, Queen Victoria, the story would be very different. Rather than pass to her second-born son, Edward VII, succession would apply to her firstborn, her daughter Victoria. From Victoria, the line of succession would pass through the Prussian royal family, dear old Kaiser Bill, on down to a woman named Frederica von der Osten, the oldest child of Princess Felicitas, who died in 2009. But this is completely hypothetical, and Mrs. von der Osten poses no threat to good old Charlie. Number 8. Margaret's Half a Crown as outlined in works by Jane Austen, there is an old act in British inheritance law known as entailment, in which in the absence of a will, all property is to be transferred en masse to the eldest son. Upon a lack of a male heir, all property is to be divided equally among one's daughters. Now, the title and throne of supreme ruler of the British Empire was not in mind when this law was written, and in modern times, this obsolete law is fairly ignored. As it was assumed the elder daughter Elizabeth would inherit her father's status, a will was not required from the ailing king. But if Parliament really wanted to nitpick, they could have hypothetically enacted this antiquated custom and divided the throne between Elizabeth and her sister Margaret. Akin to William III and Mary II's joint rule, the Frankish customs of the Carolingians, or modern-day Andorra. Upon Margaret's death in 2002, her half a crown would then pass to her eldest son, David Armstrong Jones, the Earl of Snowdon, who would rule as a joint monarch. His heir apparent would be his son Charles. The United Kingdom would have two heirs apparent named Charles. Number 7. The Tudor Heir Henry VIII specified in his will were his line to end, which it did, his throne was to pass to the descendants of his sister Mary, and so upon the death of Elizabeth I, it would have gone to her cousin Lady Jane Grey, except that Elizabeth's sister Mary had Jane executed some 50 years earlier. Instead of passing to Mary Tudor's next in line, the throne was given to the descendants of Mary and Henry's sister Margaret, the reigning monarchs of Scotland, against Henry VIII's will. 
Had Henry's will carried properly, the throne would have instead gone to Edward Seymour, the nephew of Lady Jane Grey from her sister Catherine. From Edward, the throne would pass to current day lords and ladies of Kinloss. Mary Freeman Grenville, the 12th Lady Can Put Loss, on learning of her stolen birthright, exclaimed she wouldn't take the job for all the tea in China. I have quite enough to do, she said, looking after a family of three while attending the House of Lords three times a week. As some considered Edward Seymour illegitimate, one alternative to this alternative would be Lady Anne Stanley, the great granddaughter of Mary Tudor. As her line becomes extinct, it then passes to the descendants of her sister Frances. Through Francis, the throne then passes through the Egerton and Villiers families to Lady Carolyn Ogilvie, daughter of the 9th Earl of Jersey at this present. Her heir apparent would be her son, one Timothy Melgund, CEO of Paper Chase Stationery Manufacturers. Number 6. The Abdication of Richard II On the 29th September 1399, Henry Bolingbroke was crowned Henry IV of England following the abdication of Richard II, except Henry wasn't next in line. That honor belonged to Edmund Mortimer, the descendant of Edward III's second surviving son, Lionel of Antwerp, the Duke of Clarence. Henry was the descendant of Edward's third son, John of Gaunt, and his first wife, Blanche of Lancaster. As Edmund's descendants married into the House of York, this alternative line would be short-lived, as the two lines would converge under Edward IV. Number 5. John of Gaunt John of Gaunt married his mistress, Catherine Swinford, in 1396, and his children were then declared legitimized by King Richard II, as well as the church. However, they were barred from inheriting the throne. Were the Wars of the Roses to have played out differently, this may have been overturned. Instead, Henry Bolingbroke's line ended upon the death of Edward, the Prince of Wales, and Henry Tudor was crowned Henry VII. Were the descendants of Bolingbroke's younger half-siblings to have been given preference to Tudor, the crown would be in the possession of the Somerset family, Dukes of Beaufort. In August of 2017, would-be King David Somerset passed away, leaving his son Henry as the hypothetical monarch. Henry's heir apparent would be his son, also called Henry. Number 4. Matilda Jones Seven-year-old Matilda Jones of Doncaster discovered what resembled an ancient sword while having a casual swim in Cornwall's Dosemary Pool. Immediately, news outlets were reporting the story's remarkable similarity with the legend of King Arthur, who received Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake in a similar fashion, some say even in the same body of water, and went on to rule Britain, defeat the Saxons, etc, etc. Despite the sword having been claimed by one Mark Wilkins, who put it there less than 30 years ago, adorable Matilda Jones is still the rightful queen in the hearts of millions around the world. Number 3. Anglo-Saxon Claims In 2007, English Heritage, a government-sponsored charity that identifies, surveys, and protects areas of historical significance, announced it was looking for a modern-day heir to the Anglo-Saxon rulers and heirs displaced by William the Conqueror in 1066. Which is odd, because as far as we know, the answer to that is simple. Edward the Confessor had no heirs, male or female. His grandnephew, Edgar the Atheling, likewise had no children, but he did have two sisters. His sister Margaret, later Saint Margaret, married Scottish King Malcolm III. Her daughter, Edith, married Henry I of England, fourth son to William the Conqueror. Margaret's daughter Mary married Eustace of Bologna, and their daughter Matilda married King Stephen of England. And from three of Margaret's sons, the Scottish royal succession continues until James VI of Scotland became James I of England, seemingly tying up loose ends. The only line from Margaret that doesn't merge into the Norman succession, essentially, derives from her eldest son Ethelred. From Ethelred, we receive the Earls of Fife and later the Dukes of Hamilton. Ironically, it is the duty of the sitting Duke of Hamilton to bear the crown for the reigning monarch during Scottish royal ceremonies. Forever the bridesmaid, never the bride. As for the heirs to Harold Godwinson, who tragically lost all Anglo-Saxon power in England after receiving an unfortunately placed heir to the eye at the Battle of Hastings, little is certain. Many of his descendants married into other prominent English and European families, including the Neville family. One member, Anne Neville, married Edward the Black Prince and later Richard III. Yeesh. So to answer the question over whom is the current day successor to the doomed Anglo-Saxons, the most likely answer is, uh, we've already got her. Unless, of course, you take into account the next option. Number 2. Jacobite Succession 
There were little worries in 1673 when the conversion to Roman Catholicism of James II and VII of England and Scotland, respectively, was made public. After all, he had two Protestant daughters in line to the throat and no other heirs. That is, until he married the Catholic Mary of Medina, who was later discovered to be pregnant. Parliament panicked and James was deposed in favor of his daughter Mary and her husband, William of Orange. But Parliament needed to make sure none of James's Catholic or Catholic sympathizing descendants could ever reclaim the throne and risk another civil war. And so, in 1701, Parliament passed the Act of Settlement, banning any Catholic or successor married to a Catholic from inheriting the crown. Good thing too, as neither Mary nor her sister Anne bore any surviving heirs. Mary of Medina gave birth to a son, 10th of June, 1688, healthy, strong, and Catholic as all hell. James Francis Edward Stuart, later known as the Old Pretender, would make several unsuccessful attempts at reclaiming the throne throughout his life. Despite the support of the French and the Pope, nothing ever became of it. James's claims would continue by his son, Charles Edward Stuart, better known today as Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Young Pretender. Charlie launched a disastrous invasion of Great Britain, as the country was now called, that culminated in his crushing loss to King George II at the Battle of Culloden in April of 1746. Despite numerous relatives ahead of her in succession, the throne was promised by Parliament to Sophia of Hanover, when it was realized Anne would die without her heir. And though Sophia predeceased Anne, the Electress's son Georg Ludwig instead assumed the throne as King George I. The Bonnie Prince died without legitimate issue. His brother Henry was an ordained cardinal and likewise had no recognized children. And so the line of James II ended, and with it any realistic hope of a proper Stuart monarch. Modern Jacobites consider the current Windsor family, who descended from Sophia and her mother Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James I and VI, as merely cadet branch of the Stuart family, and that the true heir should descend from Henrietta Stuart, the daughter of Charles I and first cousin to Sophia of Hanover. Were Henrietta's descendants to claim providence, her current heir would be one Franz Wittelsbach, the reigning Duke of Bavaria. His heir presumptive third in line is his great nephew Prince Wenzel of Liechtenstein, who is also second in line to the Liechtenstein throne. In 2015, an amendment enacted removing the portion of the original act of sediment banning a Protestant successor married to a Catholic. Before we announce our number one alternative succession to the British throne, let's review some honorable mentions. Peter Paninsky. Researcher Peter Paninsky claims Bonnie Prince Charlie secretly married his mistress, Clementina Valkenshaw, legitimizing their... Is that an English name? Walkenshaw? Clementina Walkenshaw? We'll say Walkenshaw. Researcher Peter Paninsky claims Bonnie Prince Charlie secretly married his mistress, Clementina Walkenshaw, legitimizing their daughter Charlotte. And though Charlotte, too, would bear illegitimate children, Paninsky claims she would eventually marry and bear a legitimate son, Antime, from whom Paninsky descends. His research has been sponsored and verified by many other scholars, some of which Jacobite, but at this point, what's really the point anymore? Just give it a rest, buddy. Nobody cares. The Windsors. Had Edward VIII not abdicated, any children by him and Wallace Simpson, or whomever he would have married, would have been ahead of now Queen Elizabeth in order of succession. But he didn't, so there's no point wasting any more time talking of it. Salic primogeniture. Had British succession followed the same principles of its ruling house, the House of Hanover, female heirs would only be considered under the circumstance of zero eligible male heirs under Salic law. Therefore, Victoria would have been ineligible to ascend the throne in favor of her uncle Ernst Augustus. And so Ernst ascended the Hanoverian throne and Victoria the British one. The current head of the House of Hanover is also called Ernst August. Under Salic law, Ernst would also be King of Great Britain. And finally, number one, the heir to George Plantagenet. In 2004, Great Britain's Channel 4 aired a documentary called Britain's Real Monarch, hosted by famed Black Adder actor and television presenter Tony Robinson. The program, which also aired in Australia and the United States, outlined a popular thesis regarding Edward IV and George Plantagenet, the Duke of Clarence. Some scholars believe there is ample evidence Edward IV of England was not the biological son of Richard of York, therefore not a descendant of Edward III and not qualified to inherit England's monarchy. It is said Richard was away on campaign Pain and Pontoise for the month Edward was supposedly conceived, with no records in existence suggesting Edward was born premature, it could be speculated Edward's mother, Cecily Neville, conceived the future king with an anonymous male lover. Or, you know, they simply forgot his birthday. It was a popular notion of the Middle Ages, and from then on, for political enemies to encourage rumors of a sovereign's illegitimacy. It was also remarked how little Edward resembled his alleged father Richard. 
Edward IV was said to be extremely handsome. Philip de Commons referred to the king as a man so vigorous and handsome that he might have been made for the pleasures of the flesh, which is a little creepy. And others believe he more likely resembles Susan Boyle. Even if Edward is the biological son of Richard, it is also believed his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was not official, and all of his ten children with her illegitimate. Busy woman. If it is true Edward's parentage is less than royal, succession should instead descend from his brother George Plantagenet. George's genealogy passes through the Pole and Hastings family to present-day Simon Abney Hastings, the 15th Earl of Loudoun. The Australian Earl succeeded his late father, retired farmer Michael Abney Hastings, in 2012, the previous Earl having emigrated to Australia in 1960. Mr. Abney Hastings has thus far made no public announcement with intent to claim the coveted British crown, but you know old Lizzie has her eye on him. Just bring it, Simon. Go ahead and try. Who do you think should be reigning queen or king of Great Britain? Is there anybody we left out? Let us know what you think in the comments. I've been Johnny. You're always welcome in my neck of the woods. Well, I hope you liked that video. Feel free to leave a comment below telling us what you think or would like to see in any future videos. And be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons and stay tuned for more great content from Mortar and Ivy, preserving the culture and class of our glorious past.